On behalf of Russ College's Ida B. Wells, Barnett, Social Justice Distinguished Lecture Series Committee, and Dr. Ivy Taylor, President of Russ College, it is with pleasure I introduce my friend and colleague for more than 40 years, Nana Dr. Kwame Leroy Frazier. A 1974 graduate of Russ College, he earned his PhD degree in chemistry from Memphis State University in 1983. Professor and Chair of the Division of Social Science at Russ College from 1980 to 1985. He's a professor of chemistry at Baylor University during the late 1980s. He's professor and executive president and interim president of Morris Brown College during the 1990s. President of the Divine Fulfillment Institute, a universal school without walls. He's a world traveler. He's lived and worked in various countries to include Ghana, Nigeria, Togo, Liberia, the Gambia, Senegal, and Guinea-Bissau. Dr. Kwame Leroy Frazier, a distinguished educator and world humanitarian, but he etched his name in history as a student at Russ College during the 1970s. In 1972, he filed a federal lawsuit for the right for students, college students, in the United States to be able to register and vote in the city and state where they attended college. In the famous case, uh, 1972 case, Fraser versus Calicut of the United States, the Northern District of Mississippi ruled in favor of Fraser, giving colleges and university students the right to register and vote in the city and state where they attended college or the university. Dr. Fraser is here today to give us some insights into that case as well as the importance of voting. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Nana Dr. Kwame Leroy Frazier. My name is Dr. Nana Kwame Adibawale Bisanta Makoda Leroy Frazier. I incorporate my African ancestral names in addition to my American name, and I'm happy to be your distinguished lecturer today. Thank you for this opportunity. It's a great opportunity because Russ College is near and dear to me. I'm so happy to be here to share some of my experiences as a uh, college student when I was at Russ College and long before, and also to provide some element of history related to black people. But more specifically, my experiences at uh, Russ College uh, during the time between September 18th of 1972 and uh, September 18th of 1974. I want to share some experiences that perhaps will resonate with individuals throughout history as far as Russ College is concerned. I will entitle this talk, Getting Into Good Trouble Through Voter Registration and Social Justice. I'm so honored to be here to President Taylor and to the professors and the students and administrators all, to be a part of this 2021 virtual Ida B. Wells Barnett Social Justice and Distinguished Lecture Series. I consider this to be one of the most important lectures that I have ever delivered during my lifetime. I'm so excited about being here. I wish that my ancestors, former professors, and former students could be present to engage in this intellectual and practical exchange today. I feel their spirits. Therefore, they are here with us now. I want to engage your conscious mind in hopes that my words will move you to be a change agent in building a better you, a better nation, and a better world. The 19th and 20th centuries produced many change agents civil rights and human rights activists that inspired me to be a better me and to help create a better world. Some of those transformational change agents were Sojourner Truth, and I'm going to call them in the chronological order of their birth. Frederick Douglass, Harriet Tubman, How She Touched Us, Booker T. Washington, 
Ida B. Wells, whom we honor today. W.E.B. Du Bois is written within the history in terms of how he impacted black people. James Weldon Johnson, Mary McLeod Bethune, I call them by name today and remember them. Dr. L. M. McCoy, a president of Russ College. Roy Wilkins, Dorothy Heights. Fannie Lou Hamer, who inspired me tremendously. Dr. W. A. McMillan, president of Russ College. Medgar Evers, Malcolm X. Martin Luther King, and the list goes on and on. Many that you will substitute names in, and we will remember them as change agents. And they helped to lead the human, civil, political, social, and economic rights for black people in the United States. They left a valuable roadmap for generations yet unborn to use and change the fabrics of our society in favor of black people. Finally, it is my hope during this talk that you who listen today will answer yes to the divine calling to get into some good trouble as you carry out your humanitarian duties as change agents in the generations that you live and serve. There are infinite possibilities and opportunities awaiting you. You are called to help solve problems at the local, state, national, and international levels. You are called to brighten up the corner where you are now and where you will be in the future. Let me say a few words about the person whom we honor today Ida B. Wells Barnett. Ida B. Wells Barnett showed us how to serve her generation and make a lasting impact on our world. Born as a slave in Holly Springs, Mississippi, educated at Russ College, caretaker of her siblings after the death of her parents, she once said, I came home every Friday afternoon, riding the six miles on the back of a big mule. I spent Saturday and Sunday washing and ironing and cooking for the children, and went back to my country school on Sunday afternoon. She was a prominent journalist, activist, and researcher. She was a strong fighter against racism, sexism, and violence. And you know, she got into some good trouble as she fought for freedom and justice in the United States. She once said, I felt that one had better die fighting against injustice than to die like a dog or a rat in a trap. Her footprints are forever etched in Holly Springs and around the world. She and other civil rights leaders inspired me and others to stand up and speak out when things do not appear to be right in our hearts, minds, and soul. I want to just focus on two quotes, one from Harriet Tubman, the other from Frederick Douglass. Harriet Tubman once said, I had crossed the line. I was free but there was no one there to welcome me to the land of freedom. I was a stranger in a strange land. Frederick Douglass once said, if there is no struggle, there is no progress. And so my intent today is to ignite your hearts throughout generations, to ignite your hearts, minds, and souls and inspire you to stand up and speak out for things that are important to you and your generation. During the time of my birth, I found two worlds, two societies around me. Like the early change agents or civil rights leaders, I am an integral part of the black movement 
for social justice, freedom, liberty, and equality in America. I had some eye-opening experiences with social justice during my high school and college years. The world that I was born into was much different from the world that my children and grandchildren live in today. Things have changed, yet a lot of things remain the same. I was born into the old society where blacks and whites were separate and unequal. I was born during a time when black people were considered as second-class citizens and sometimes not citizens at all. I watched my grandparents, parents, uncles, aunts, siblings, cousins, neighbors, and friends as they acted out their expected roles as good, obedient, second-class citizens. Their white counterparts had their idea of how black people should act in their presence, and black people were punished if they did not comply. I did not like what I was seeing. It pained me to see the fear in the faces of people that I love so dearly. Where did this fear come from? This fear can be traced back to the transatlantic slave trade, intra-America slave trade, and the Jim Crow era. The fear within them caused post-traumatic stress disorder. Sometimes we say PTSD in their lives and in the lives of their descendants, you and me. At an early age, I decided that I would not live my life in fear the way that my ancestors did. I decided that I would not act out the role that my white counterparts expected me to. There were some voices that I was hearing during those times, and I'll share some of those voices today. As a little boy, I always felt divine, infinite intelligence flowing toward me from somewhere in the universe it was coming. Some of that divine, infinite intelligence was coming from black change agents that had walked this life road long before me. I was always listening, eager to hear more, and implementing what I was hearing. Let me share some of those voices that I heard. Sojourner Truth once said, children, who made your skin white? Was it not God? Who made mine black? Was it not the same God? Am I to blame, therefore, because my skin is black? Does not God love colored children as well as white children? And did not the same Savior die to save the one as well as the other? Dr. Martin Luther King once said, I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where well, they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. As a little boy growing up in Mississippi, Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech stuck with me and helped me to chart a different course for my life. From a young age, I just accepted the fact that my life and the life of boys and girls like me have value. You have great value. Let me share with you something about the Supreme Court decisions that has impacted us negatively and positively. In two of my books, I talk about the experience. One is branded with African blood, talks about the African experiences in Africa before coming to America. And Mississippi Beneath the Surface talked about our ancestors' experience upon arriving on the American shore. The Reconstruction era between 1865 and 1877 proved to be a great opportunity for the newly free slaves and their descendants in the political and educational arena. In 1890, Mississippi held a state constitutional convention and uh, incorporated changes that significantly reduced uh, uh, the value of black citizens. It focused on separate and unequal among the races. 
In 1892, the separate and equal principle was tested. Homer Plessy, a man with one-eighth black blood, purchased a first-class train ticket from New Orleans and sat in a car for white riders only. He was taken off the train and charged with violating the Louisiana State separate car law and put in jail. His case was heard before Judge Howard Ferguson one month later. Judge Ferguson ruled that Plessy had broken the separate uh, car law. The Louisiana Supreme Court upheld his, uh, his situation, and that brought about separate but equal case. In 1896, the United States Supreme Court upheld the constitutionality of racial segregation under the separate but equal doctrine in the Homer Plessy versus John Howard Ferguson case. In 1954, the United States Supreme Court ruled in Oliver Brown versus the Board of Education case that separating children in public schools based upon race was unconstitutional. And I paused there for a minute. I paused there for a minute to talk about that. Because in 1954, the ruling had taken place that it was unconstitutional to, to do it, separate them based upon race. And yet 15 years went by and Mississippi would continue to defy, continue, refused to accept the court ruling. I was a victim of the racial segregation during all of my public school years. 1958 to 1970. That was not right. It was time for my high school classmates and I to get into some good trouble. So between 1968 and 1970, I led a major protest to fight against the inequalities that I observed in my high school system. The protests sometimes closed down the schools for two to three days in an academic year. That was some good trouble. We stood up and spoke up against injustice that we saw and experienced during our high school years. Our efforts paid off big time because in 1969, the United States Supreme Court ordered immediate desegregation. I underline immediate desegregation of public schools in the South. The case was Beatrice Alexander versus Holmes County Board of Education in Holmes County, Mississippi. In 1970, the public schools in the South hesitantly complied with the integration mandate of the Supreme Court. And although I never attended an integrated public school, my younger siblings and their friends attended starting in the fall of 1970. That became a major trans transformational point in my life. Uh, the black leaders continued to speak, and I could hear their voices. I could hear the voice of Ida B. Wells saying, the South resented giving the African American his freedom, the ballot box, and the civil rights law. In 1962, Fannie Lou Hamer had a strong desire to register and vote. She was confronted by one roadblock after another. When she finally seceded, she returned home where the owner of the plantation, of which she worked as a sharecropper, gave her an ultimatum. If you don't go back down there and turn down and withdraw that voter registration, you will have to leave my place. And guess what? She chose to leave and never turn back. Medgar Evers once said, our only hope is to control the vote. Remember that in, 20, in 2000 and beyond. Our only hope is to control the vote. Mary McLeod Bethune once said, we have a powerful potential in our youth, and we must have the courage to change old ideas and practices so that uh, we may direct their power toward good ends. The conscious quotes of these black change agents stirred up something in the Russ College students in the 1960s. 
The 1960s brought Russ College students civil rights activists like Leslie B. Bachtemore, William Scott, Ernestine Scott, Joseph Stone, Charles Williams, and many, many more that engaged in freedom rides, Mississippi Freedom Summer Voter Registration Drives, New Mississippi Freedom Party, and other political activities. Let me share with you, share with you something about my Russ College years. By the time that I enrolled as a student at Russ College in 1970, I was already an integral part of the black movement. I was already a change agent, and I was ready for some more good trouble as a good boy in college. As a new Russ College student, it was our time to take up the mantle and continue the fight for social justice, freedom, liberty, and equality in Holly Springs, Marshall County, Mississippi, America, and the world. During the 1972-73 academic year, I served as president of the Student Government Association at Russ College. I was a 20-year-old, uh, a 20 year older and I uh, was a junior at Russ College. My SGA platform was equalizing the playing field and breaking down barriers between black people and white people in Holly Springs, Marshall County, and the state of Mississippi. The fall of 1972 was the climax of the United States presidential election, and it was a perfect time to get into some good trouble. In September of 1972, I met with civil rights leaders in Marshall County, such as Ernest Smith, Alfred Skip Moore, I mean, Alfred Skip Robinson, uh, Henry Boyd, and uh, George Cowell. I sought their advice on how Russ College students could register and vote in the 1972 presidential election. And in September of 1972, I organized a massive campaign to get Russ College students registered so that they could vote in the 1972 presidential election. Though the Russ students were from many counties and states, we wanted to register and vote in Marshall County, Mississippi. We were energized by our desire to vote in that presidential election, Richard Nixon versus George McGovern. In September of 1972, the agenda for all of the Student Government Association meetings was registering and voting in Holly Springs. We were so excited and extremely optimistic that that, that would have been our first time voting in any government election. We were more excited and optimistic when we recognized that this was the United States presidential election. This was our opportunity to vote in a U.S. presidential election as Russ College students. And if we had waited, by the time of 1976, when the next presidential election came around, we would not have been in Holly Spring. We would have been all in, in our careers, and we would have missed this opportunity. That would have been a missed opportunity for us, and we did not want to miss that opportunity. We embraced the philosophical and practical theme that the time was now and the place was Holly Springs, the home of Russ College. We knew that our actions at that time would change Holly Springs and Marshall County forever for the better. We knew that future Russ College students would be able to live in a more welcoming environment in the city that they live while attending Russ College. Our time was 1972, and the place was Russ College in Holly Springs, Mississippi. Let me share with you that there was some voter suppression going on in 1972, and there's some voter suppression going on in 2000. But let me go back to 1972. On October 2nd, 1972, approximately 25 Russ College students walked with me uptown and into the Marshall County Circuit Clerk's office to register to vote. We exercised the courage to ask for voter registration application on the spot. You see, they didn't expect us that day. 25 students showed up. A white woman in the circuit clerk's office issued the voter registration application to us reluctantly. We sat down quietly as good Russ College students 
and completed the voter registration application. The Russ College courses did not prepare us for our personal experience with answering those simple questions on that old Marshall County voter registration application. The voter registration application asked some simple questions like, provide your current address in Marshall County. Well, we all lived on the campus, and so we gave our Russ College mailbox address. We didn't know we were being set up. Uh, the voter registration application asked for our home telephone number. Obviously, people from Chicago and Atlanta and all of these other places. So, and, and I was from uh, Hernando, Mississippi, so we gave our home telephone number. The voter registration application asked for the name and location of our churches. Well, we still members of our churches back home, wherever we were from. The voter registration application asked for the address of the most recent income tax report. When during the summertime, we went back home and worked. So that was the address. Chicago, Atlanta, wherever. The voter registration application asked for the address where the greater amounts of our possessions were located. The questions were numerous and simple. The complication came from how the simple answers would be used to approve or disapprove our voter registration application. We did not know that at the time. After completing the application, all of the Russ College students' applications were disapproved or denied on the spot if they were not residents of Marshall County. And approximately 90% of those 25 students that were standing there and trying to register were not residents of Marshall County. The voter registration application for the Marshall County residents were referred to a special board of election but not the students that were not residents of uh, Marshall County. So here we are. We asked why our applications were not approved. The white woman did not want to respond to us. I can understand to some extent. It was uncommon for black people to ask such a question to, a white, to white people at that time in the history of Mississippi. A lot of changes have taken place now. We returned to Russ College campus on that evening and wondered what our next step would be. We knew that quitting and failure were not options uh, for us. It was not on the table. We were not ready for any of that and we were not going to accept it. So here we are. We decided on the next day to meet with uh, some civil rights uh, leaders, and we decided to go to court to fight. That's what Russ College students do. When uh, they see that things are not right, they fight. So on October 3rd, the day after we left that voter registration office and we were denied, we informed the civil rights leaders of exactly what had happened in that circuit court's office. And by the Friday of that week, I and seven other Russ College students, and I'll call them by name so that we will remember them, James Tucker, Henry Mayfield, Anthony Haynes, Johnny Lee, Addie Chatty, and two other students, met with a young black attorney by the name of James Minor, who was from Coldwater, Mississippi, but a graduate of the University of Mississippi. Attorney Minor took our information and framed it into a federal lawsuit. The lawsuit focused on the denial of our rights that were guaranteed by the 14th and 15th Amendment of the United States Constitution. And it dealt with voter suppression, and I'll talk about some of that voter suppression that we dealt with. But before I do that, let me give you, for those who will be coming uh, in the future, a quick crash course 
on the United States Constitution and what we were faced with during that time in 1972. During the 1972 presidential election, the Russ College students learned a valuable lesson about the United States Constitution. And we learned it the hard and painful way. We stood on our rights that, are, that were guaranteed by the United States Constitution. I will even start with the 13th Amendment to the United States Constitution that abolished slavery in 1865. Here we are in 1972, we're not slaves. The 14th Amendment to the United States Constitution guarantees citizenship to all men, and I'm gonna underline men because I'll get to that later, black and white, and guaranteed equal protection of the laws, 1868. The Rust College male students were citizens of the United States and we demanded equal protection of the laws. The 15th Amendment of the United States Constitution guaranteed the right of male citizens, black and whites, of the United States to vote, V-O-T-E, and that right could not be denied on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude, 1870. The Russ College male students that stood in that line to register vote, uh, we were denied because of our discolor of our skin. The 19th Amendment to the United States Constitution, this is where our female students came in, prohibited states and federal governments from denying the right of citizens of the United States to vote based upon sex. That's where women came in in 1920. The Russ College female students that stood in that line on that day, they were citizens. They had a right to vote. They were denied. The 26th Amendment to the United States Constitution prohibited the states and the federal government from using age as a reason for denying U.S. citizens the right if they were at least 18 years of age. And that was in 1971. So here we are one year later. We have all just turned uh, 18 and 19. Had it been a year before, we would not have been able to register, but we were at that time. So now, armed with the knowledge of the United States Constitution, the Russ College students stood on our rights. Now let me get back to the lawsuit. So on October 11, 1972, the federal lawsuit, Leroy Frazier et al., the plaintiffs, versus Edwin W. Calicut et al., uh, defendants, was filed. The plaintiffs were the seven Russ College students and me. The defendants were Edwin W. Calicut, circuit clerk and registrar of Marshall County, and five Marshall County Board of Election Commissioners. This was a class action lawsuit charging violation of the right of Russ College students, 14th Amendment right, the right of citizenship. The lawsuit filing asked the court to issue a temporary restraining order. In other words, it asked that a formal court order be granted to protect the eight Russ College students from real or perceived threat of physical abuse harassment or other harm resulting from our active pursuit to vote in the 1972 presidential election. Why is this important? This was important during that time because the old society had a way of getting rid of black people that did not stay in their place. In other words, follow the unwritten rule. Also, the lawsuit filing asked for preliminary injunction. It asked for a formal ruling for the Russ College students to vote in the 1972 presidential election while the lawsuit was still pending. And finally, the lawsuit filing asked for a permanent injunction. In other words, it asked for a ruling for the Russ College students to vote in every future government election once the lawsuit is resolved. Quite a powerful lawsuit. So on October 18, 1972, a hearing was held in the United States Court in Clarksdale, Mississippi. 
the, the uh, temporary restraining order, the temporary injunction, and the permanent injunction were denied by the court. I will pause there for a minute and digress. It was denied. So it meant that we had to, um, to regroup. We did not stop at that point. Before that election on November the 4th, the Saturday before the presidential election, a group of Russ College students walked to the Holly Springs Square, Square and campaigned for our presidential candidate, George McGovern. Even though we could not vote, we campaigned like we were going to vote. The Russ College students were a force to be reckoned with. And we worked very hard to reckon during that particular year. Let me share with you something about the voter registration initiatives that continued even though we were denied. During the period between November 7th, 1972, and April 6th, 1972, 73, more Rust College students attempted to register to vote. They didn't stop us. We continued. A few Mississippi Industrial College students attempted to register to vote because they heard what had happened with Russ College and we all joined together. But here's what happened. Only the students who were residents of Marshall County were referred to the Marshall County Election Commission for further consideration. Students that were not residents of Marshall County were denied even after our denial. The students from Russ College and Mississippi Industrial College marched to the uh, Marshall County Courthouse for an, and demonstrated and had rallies many times during the spring of 1973. But we received some legal help. If you keep doing what you need to do, you will get some help. We, really, we received some legal help from the United States Civil Rights Division of the United States Justice Department. So in March of 1973, the Russ College students hosted attorneys from the United States Civil Rights Division of the United States Justice Department. The students were asked to share their experiences in the voter registration process in Marshall County. Now this was big time because we got the Justice Department on campus. The students met in a classroom in the Macmillan Multipurpose Building. I remember that day so well. Federal agents on our campus. On, a on April 6, 1973, the United States Civil Rights Division of the United States Department of Justice filed a federal lawsuit against Marshall County and Calicut in violation of the 14th Amendment, the right of citizenship, and the 15th Amendment, the right of citizenship, the citizens to vote all of this against the Russ College and MI students. It requested that the students be allowed to vote in an election that was going to take place in May of 1973 while we were still waiting for the big lawsuit to be settled. On April 23, 1973, an evidential hearing was held in the United States Department Court in Oxford. And uh, the, the, the motion to, uh, was denied against the uh, United States government because they felt that there was only a few days left and it was nothing of necessity to have us registered by that time, but you still got another lawsuit going on. So the judge did us a favor. The judge suggested that the two lawsuits be combined and heard concurrently. Uh, and that is exactly what happened. So there was a consolidation of the United States government lawsuit and the Leroy Frazier lawsuit, they all became one lawsuit. The consolidation meant that the case would argue the right to register to vote permanently, regardless of where we previously lived. That was a great move from that federal judge. I need to find him today and thank him. Aaron W. Calicut was represented by the Mississippi Attorney, Assistant Attorney General, and other Mississippi attorneys. Did you hear that? Let me pause for a minute. 
Holly Springs was represented by the Assistant Attorney General of Mississippi. Here we are, Russ College students, and the Assistant Attorney General of the state of Mississippi is pleading a case against its black citizens. That, that was the case at that point. And Leroy Frazier, they all were represented, the plaintiffs were represented by attorneys from the Mississippi Legal Aid and attorneys from the United States Civil Rights Division of the U.S. Department of Justice. This was big time. This was all of Russ College courses coming together, all within a courtroom in 1973. On May 30, 1973, a trial was held in the United States District Court in Oxford on the merits of consolidating the United States case and the Leroy Frazier case. The Frazier's attorneys and the United States Justice Department attorneys limited their complaint this time to just Edwin W. Calicut and left out the Board of Elections. We argued that Edwin W. Calicut was acting in his official capacity as the Register of Elections for Marsha County, Mississippi, when he denied us. We argued that Edwin W. Calicut violated our 15th Amendment rights to the Constitution, the right of the citizens to vote. Calica denied all applications that showed an address as Russ College or Mississippi Industrial College and whose previous address was in a county other than Marshall. Calicut applied one set of standards for approving or disproving voter registration to applicants from Russ College or Mississippi Industrial College, and Calicut applied another set of standards for approving or disapproving voter registration of applicants that were residents of Marshall County. So there was discrimination that was going on. But let me go to the final court hearing, and this is where history was made. This was on September 18, 1974. The final ruling by the United States District Court was that a student can register and vote in the town, city, or county that they reside while attending college or university. That was in 1974, a landmark, a landmark. The address of the college or university uh, uh, can be used in qualifying for voter registration. Yeah, we can use our post PO box now. The other personal questions were irrelevant in approving or disapproving an applicant to register and vote. The ruling helped to change election results in small college towns. The students became a force to be reckoned with. The block vote of the students could control election results. Let me pause there for a minute. What I basically want to say at this point is that we had the Mississippi attorneys fighting against us. Now, we won. We won in a federal court against the state of Mississippi that stood in our way. That's voter suppression. But we won. So in other words, the original thought about changing election results proved to be true. That was our original thought. And the reason why it proved to be true is because black candidates were elected in Marshall County for, for 46 years, have been uh, elected since that time of that lawsuit. And I am proud to have been one of the eight courageous Russ College students that helped to change the course of history in voter registration rights for students in the United States of America, not just Mississippi, in the United States of America. We used the legal court system to accomplish that purpose. This was a great lesson about the 14th Amendment, the 15th Amendment, the 19th Amendment, and the 26th Amendment to the Constitution of the United States of America. In conclusion, this is your time, whatever generation 
that you live in. This is your time right here, right now, to address and change the barriers that are before you today in your time. We are in a battle for the soul of this nation. Our great black change agents and civil rights leaders from the 19th and 20th centuries put their lives on the line that we might have the right to register and vote. You must never look for an excuse to not vote. Your votes do count. You have a right to make the United States and the world what you want it to be like. You have a right to act, speak, think, or choose as you please without hindrance or restraint. You have a right to pursue your own interests and preferences. You have a right to demand the best health care services for yourself, your family, and your community. You have a right to demand equal access to economic and medical resources. You have a right to fight against racism and discrimination in education, business, media, and the day-to-day -day life. You have a right to stand up against police harassment, unjustified arrest, and uncalled for killing of black and brown people. You have a right to stand up against paid disparities based upon race, gender, and sexual orientation of those that do the same work. You have a right to fight against hunger and poverty due to low income or no income related to unemployment. I encourage you to continue to get into some good trouble. Your time is now, and a place is where you are. Vote, vote, vote. Fight to make this world, the world that you desire for your children and grandchildren, the best place that it could ever be. We can do it together. God is all there is. And therefore, from generation to generation, for as long as I live on this earth, I look forward to coming back to the Russ College campus in Holly Springs. And when I'm no longer here, I wish that the Russ College students and administrators from years, generations yet unborn, that you will continue this trust. Thank you for this opportunity to participate in the Ida B. Wells Lecture Series. Thank you. Thank you.